Hi, I'm Dr. Alfredo Carpinetti, and I am uh, one of the Eiffel Science uh, writers. And this time we are joined by Madison Davsevich and Erin Ephraim from the Ocean Exploration Trust, because they're going to tell us about this fantastic project called Seabed 2030. Hello. Hey, Alfredo. Hey. It's good to see you. Likewise. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do and about the project? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Madison and when I'm on board Nautilus, I am the communications lead. So my job is primarily to uh, talk about science, much like you, Alfredo. And joining me today is Erin Heffron. She is the uh, lead mapper and you can talk more about your role. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. so Erin, uh, as you guys said, um, I am the mapping coordinator on this expedition. Um, often also a mapping watchstander or a navigator, depending on the type of expedition we're doing. And this expedition that we're on right now is all mapping. We've been mapping for a couple of weeks uh, out in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, and we, as an organization, this we are doing specific mapping, mapping on requests of national, the Marine National Monument to map seamounts that are within the monument, but also we've gone outside of the monument and done some mapping as well. And while the project is based around this request by the, the monument, anytime we're mapping an unmapped space, which is what we've been doing for three weeks, we are participating or making ourselves part of CBED 2030. So this bigger project. Um, so CBED 2030 is just this really big international project of everybody working together. And it's things we've been doing as mappers for years. We're always trying, we were always trying to fill the holes in the map. Um, and I don't know if your audience knows, but 80% of the world's oceans are not mapped in, in good resolution. So as, as mappers, we've always been trying to approach that question and trying to fill in those holes. Um, but on this expedition, because of where we are in the Pacific, it's just a great opportunity. There's there's gaps in the map everywhere. So we, we're filling we're filling gaps and contributing to CBED 2030 at every turn. Yeah, you're an astrophysicist. You probably know this, but as Aaron said, you know we have better maps of the surface of Mars than we do our own seafloor. So it's pretty phenomenal to to sort of gauge you know how much work is left to be done within the next decade. Wow, 80% is not mapped. Uh, that is literally mind boggling. Just to start, how, what is the resolution that you hope to achieve uh, by 2030 of 100% of the seafloor mapped? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I don't know all of the numbers off of my head. It will depend on the depth of the ocean and what's achievable. So in the depths that we're capable of mapping in with our sonar, um, our sonar hits 6,000 meters on a good day <laughs> and uh, it's pushing it. Um, and with, uh, with so with that, we, we can pretty much get 100 meter resolution. But if you uh, look on the CBED 2030 website, that resolution does change. And as we get into say like the Marianas Trench, you know, 10,000 plus meters of water, you have to make adaptations as to what counts as high resolution, right? So it's a it's an open question, um, and yeah, I, I can't remember off the top of my head as it gets deeper. But let's say that they are aiming for maybe 500 meter resolution in the, the deepest ocean trenches, um, and the minnow. But we we always always try to get at least 100 meters or better. Yeah, and just you know to kind of highlight that when we're looking at a, a map like this, this is Google Earth, this darker blue. Um, area that's what's known as satellite altimetry data and those are more or less estimates from satellites right so we can see this is an interesting feature right here or it could be um, but we don't really have that great detail and then when we're looking at areas that have been mapped by ship you can really see sort of the difference in detail and and it tells us a lot more about what that seafloor looks like and um, sort of you know what animals or deep sea organisms might habitate there that is fascinating um can you tell me a little bit more about the importance uh, of mapping uh, the seafloor at uh, high resolution uh, throughout uh, the world's oceans and seas? Yeah, sure. Um, well, for me, it's it's just curiosity. Like, why should we not know what the, our seafloor looks like? Especially, again, coming back to the Mars comparison, we have these super high resolution maps of Mars, but not of our own seafloor. So as a mapper, I just, it, it's totally just, curiosity like i want to see what's there but there are bigger picture items right um as we become more of this global world community where we're all kind of 
you know, interacting with each other closely. It's good to know what resources are down there, what is down there, um, either for extraction. I mean, we can't get around the fact that we do need to have minerals of different types for our phones and things, and that the, the deep sea vents are a, a place where they can get that, um, but also to decide what we're going to protect and what we hold as valuable as, as the world's community, um, what we think should should remain untouched. And so, yeah, Maddie just queued up a really beautiful image of some hydrothermal vents. You want to talk about that? Yeah, so these are, um, this is the Endeavor vent, vent field um, in uh, just off the coast of uh, Western Canada. And just like Aaron said, there are all different sorts of um, habitats and deep sea sort of ecosystems, if you will, that we don't really know exist. And, and so we can get kind of an idea of what might be on the sea floor uh, by looking at maps, right? We have sort of clues to the bigger puzzle. Um, but really, you know, getting an understanding of, of sort of these broader processes that happen along the seafloor uh, can also help to inform, you know, how they contribute to the broader uh, climate and systems on our planet. So one of my favorite examples is um, we know that there are methane seeps along the seafloor, and that's a relatively uh, new discovery within the last three, few decades or so. Um, we don't know how many there are. We're constantly discovering new ones. And of course, methane is um, a contributing gas to climate change. So one of the bigger questions, for example, is how does you know methane from these deep sea seeps maybe contribute to climate change or maybe not, right? And so mapping is really that first step in, in getting eyes on the seafloor and understanding sort of really what that, that ecosystem is. Yeah, it really, that's a really great example. And that is an example of something that, you know, may or may not, we're not sure that, that most of that methane that's being released from the seafloor actually reaches the surface. So that's part of the understanding. But the fact that all those seeps exist is truly a byproduct of just mapping. Um, people were mapping, um, one of the first big discoveries was off the east coast of the US. Um, our colleagues at, on the Okeanos Explorer um, were just trying to map the US EEZ and discovered all of these seeps just by accident. And that is because they had a sonar turned on and they wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, it's great when we get to take an ROV down and really explore these areas, but that covers a postage stamp. With the sonars and their ability to cover large areas, we are getting a, a remote picture and maybe not every detail, but still getting a bigger picture of bigger areas so that we can then also focus on, you know, where do we want to send the ROVs and really understand what's down there, what the habitat looks like, what the community looks like, should this be protected, etc. Yeah. And I know, Aaron, this is one of your favorite videos, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've done some interactions <laughs> together, apparently. Um, but this is the Octopus Garden. It's, you know, it's been nicknamed now that we know more or less what it is, but we didn't really know that this existed. We just sort of saw some interesting features on a map, right? And then decided to bring ROVs down. Yeah, so this was uh, Monterey Bay, or it's not Monterey Bay, it's Mon Monterey. We'll just say Monterey. <laughs> um, and they are most known for Davidson Seamount, which is a beautiful seamount, been really well explored um, by Ambari and others. This was a, a little side seamount, and the, the folks that had come up in the mapping data, they knew it was there, and they were like, well, I wonder what's there. <laughs> and we went and looked and, um, you know, we had the maps, but we never anticipated this. So this was a great combination of seeing an interesting feature in the bathymetry and then going to explore it with ROVs and really seeing something that's so worthy of being protected and kept safe um, and so beautiful and my favorite thing that I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. So, um, I have a question on uh, uh, where is uh, the Nautilus mapping? So you've uh, discussed around uh, um, Hawaii at the moment, uh, um, how far in the Pacific uh, does uh, Nautilus go? And is there going to be a particular area that you're look, really looking forward to map? Yeah, that's a, a really great, great question. I think uh, one of our mappers today calculated we were roughly 900 miles from Honolulu, oh, yeah? more or less. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so away. we're out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're operating, uh, like Aaron said, in the northern Hawaiian islands. Um, it's a, in an area called Papahanaumokuakea National Marine Monument. Um, and of course, a lot of this exploration has been possible through collaborations with uh, the sanctuaries team and the monument team you know, of course, we acknowledge that this is these are the waters of uh, traditional Hawaiian culture. And uh, so it's been absolutely a privilege to work uh, in these waters. 
but yeah, so we're we're pretty far out. We haven't seen shore for about three weeks. Yeah, <laughs> not even a speck. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and we're about three days from Honolulu. We're actually tr uh, starting our transit back tonight. Um, but of particular interest is this ridge area called Liliuokalani Ridge. Um, and Aaron, my understanding is that it's of particular interest because it's sort of a different um, uh, geology, right? Yeah, I think the kind of the simplified story, as I understand it, is um, you know they explain a lot of volcanism in this part of the world by hotspots. Um, that's how we explain Hawaii. And um, some of these seamounts make sense in that model and some do not. And so it's like, why are there two forks? Are they different? Are they different ages? And so we're doing the initial mapping with the anticipation of coming back next year with the ROVs, getting rock samples that we can date and then they can do better interpretation of how, how and why those ridges are there. This is the, the kind of detail we want to see before we send ROVs down. So in addition to just adding to the global data model, um, which can be used for everything from climate models to, to anything, deciding what a good fishing ground will be, um, we also will use these maps to decide where to put the ROVs down um, safely. So we always map over an area uh, before, we, before we deploy the vehicles and know the slopes, know a good place to land, know where we have to be cautious, all of that. And what's most likely to be interesting because everybody wants to see cool stuff yeah. <laughs> when we go down. Yeah, and what an interesting and actually very timely thing, um, I saw our expedition leader actually sent it out to the group. There was um, a submarine that collided recently with a yeah. seamount. Uh, and they didn't necessarily know that it was there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that was the Navy. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, come on, guys. Uh, so that's, that's just like a really relevant, you know, it's cool. This is exciting. These are places that have never been mapped. Um, but there are also inherent risks involved when, when we're kind of diving both as an exploration purpose or as a military purpose uh, in places that aren't mapped. So, of course, all of this data goes to um, an international collaborative to map the entire seafloor as a part of Seabed 2030. Um, and then of course, you know, those maps are used for a multitude of purposes. Yeah, and just to go back, you had asked where we plan to go next year, we'll be even further into the South Pacific. So um, Johnson Atoll, I can't even remember, but we'll be <laughs> moving further south um, back down um, into some of the more remote islands in the Pacific. Nautilus will be in the Pacific for a couple of years. Uh, we used to be doing these Pacific transits and going back to our home port of San Pedro, but now we're staying we're staying in Hawaii for a couple of years. So we have better access to get into the, the deep Pacific and some of these gaps and holes that have very little chance of getting filled otherwise. So I think we're gonna accomplish a lot in the next couple of years as far as filling, filling holes in the international seafloor map. That is fantastic. I haven't got any more questions, but is there anything else you would like uh, the the public to know about uh, your work uh, or CBAT 2030? It's oh, a good question. Um, I just, I'm happy that the CBAT 2030, if anything, has brought some attention to mapping and our lack of understanding of our oceans. Um, so has the UN Decade of the Ocean. All these things happening at once have really brought a spotlight to the work that's being done in the ocean. And ocean work is expensive and difficult, and it's really hard, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. um, you know, some days are great, and some days we can't get anything done because of the wind and the waves and the water. So um, I just want the world to know that it's hard, but we love doing it, and we love the opportunity to be able to do it. And I am, we just are happy that people are supporting the science and, and getting the funding to us so that we can continue to do this kind of work. Absolutely, and I also think it's really, to add to that, important to acknowledge, of course, uh, the local communities that we've been working with. Yes, um, definitely. And there's a lot of different resources and you know, great information about the role that uh, traditional Hawaiian knowledge plays in science. And I think it's really exciting to uh, be beginning to see how indigenous culture and, and information and knowledge can also lead into these greater scientific discoveries as well. And the two are really connected and we couldn't do science without that, so. Um, really really been special and, and an honor to be a part of it well that is fantastic to hear so thank you very much maddie thank you very much erin uh, for sharing uh, your work uh, in uh, mapping uh, the ocean floor thanks for caring <laughs> it's cool <laughs>